let's try this that probably works a bit better sorry um, my noise gates probably a bit oversensitive so what I was saying yes is um, it is Sartre uh, hopefully that's not cutting out so much now Sartre has um, this this particular position in 1969 in this interview with the new left review um, which is, uh, has a specific place in the sort of the, a, a, a particular format a uh, formation rather of the left-wing movement and in 1969 Sartre is engaged quite heavily um, with uh, the Marxist movement the left-wing movement and it is in, it's a kind of strange place to find him in some ways if you if you're sitting here reading Transcendence of the Ego a text that's like focused in a very sort of technical way almost on sort of uh, abstract concepts inside philosophy although the concepts are all directed towards understanding consciousness um, it's a very abstract it's a very academic text <coughs> it's one that doesn't have like mentions of class struggle or politics in it um, and so it's a little odd uh, to realize that, that in fact Sartre's primary dynamic um, involves from after being a nothingness involves a kind of movement of engagement with Marxism um, which we're not going to be able to explore enormously today but it's interesting to kind of think about this so there's a dynamic that takes place in Sartre from the transcendence of the ego through the next major work that he produces in a sense the being and nothingness he does produce other works but that's kind of the next major work he produces um, and the sort of formation of what we can call a Sartrean existentialism uh, which looks like an extreme kind of individualism in many ways and uh, what occurs is that, is that from that point that he's really being a nothingness, Sartre begins to move into problems of ethics and problems of, of um, uh, society. And it's at that point he begins to engage in Marxism. And so from the 50s and 60s, Sartre is engaged in this, this very interesting uh, dialogue between existentialism and Marxism. And in fact, um, there's a very interesting book of his called Between Existentialism and Marxism. And um, the interview with the New Left Review is in that book. Uh, and it's called the interview this called the itinerary of a thought and uh, uh, yeah exactly I mean it, so in that in transcendence of the ego Sartre is, is fundamentally engaged in that it's sort of intra inside philosophy discussion and um, and then this kind of moves into another dynamic um, but one of the things he says in the itinerary of a thought, this interview in the New Left Review, is he gives a self-description of um, his project, uh, his philosophical project, um, and he gives that self-description in terms that kind of cover all of the work from transcendence the ego through being a nothingness up through the engagement with Marxism and to his later work. And he says in that that his um, aim has always been to provide a philosophical foundation for realism. And this is to quote him. Um, how to give man both his autonomy and his reality among real objects, avoiding idealism without lapsing into mechanistic materialism. And this is this is not an uncommon strategy, actually. Um, this 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 uh, attempt to um, propose a distinction between uh, a kind of mechanistic materialism on the one hand and, a, and an idealism on the other, and that, that somehow both of these are failures, and we need to have a third pathway. So this is not an uncommon strategy, and this is kind of a key way in which Sartre perceives his work to be going um, and it, it, as part of that um, the engagement with the Freudian unconscious that we kind of come across inside the transcendence of the ego is, is worth thinking about a little bit because in, in a sense that kind of engagement with the Freudian unconscious which seems a little odd in some ways um, it, why is that kind of there in a sense obviously it's a kind of it's an element of, of relationship to the notion of consciousness but why specifically there and, and moreover there's a continual engagement with psychology and a kind of rejection of psychology some of which I want to explore next week in um, in, in the book the emotions in which there's there's a much sort of stronger engagement with psychology but this relationship to Freudian unconscious as a concept that we find in the text is part in a sense or, or partly explicable in a sense in terms of this relationship to his strategy to give man his autonomy and his reality among real objects um, so avoiding idealism and mechanistic materialism and in a sense one of the things he, he kind of accuses Freudian um, concepts and Freudian concepts of the unconscious being is, a, is an ambiguation between what he calls causality and finality between something like idealism and mechanistic materialism and so one of his rejections we can say of Freudian the Freudian unconscious is part of a sort of an expression of this strategy that he wants to 
as I say, give autonomy to man in his reality amongst real objects. And this this is important in a sense because one of the things that's going on inside a lot of Sartre's work, and something that's, that we need to kind of bear in mind when we try and understand his arguments, is um, is this constantly strategic orientation for his arguments. He's constantly trying to deploy his arguments um, as philosophical strategies in an ongoing debate. And so often that involves us being caught inside conversations that have got a, a, lot of, a lot of background, a lot of stuff going on in the background. And it's one of the difficulties in understanding transcendence of the ego. Um, it's one of the difficulties because without, you know, in a sense, having the background um, relationship, which I tried to sort of briefly cover a little bit last week, the relationship to Kant and to Husserl, the relationship to appearance and reality, the relationship to problems um, of appearance, uh, and in particular the way in which phenomenology then particularly addresses those problems. Without that kind of background, it can be a little bit confusing to understand what's going on. But the key to remember, I think, is that Sartre... Um, isn't uh isn't just i mean i wouldn't say honestly approaching his subject that's not the right way of putting it he's he's always approaching his subject with a view to where his arguments can take him um and that that central to that is it, there are always strategies for attempting to articulate autonomy and that's kind of the crux of everything we need to understand about Sartre. he's always in this strategic mode of attempting to articulate autonomy let me just um let me just bring up something that I want to share, I want to read through here. Uh, and this is again from this essay in the New Left Review, the itinerary of a thought. Um, this is a little bit later after he describes his strategy, not much later, this is only page 34, page 35 of the book Existenti Between Existentialism and Marxism. And so this is him here again talking about his kind of ongoing approach. And, and the reason I'm sort of trying to articulate this and trying to sort of give this as our frame this week is because um, in order for us to begin to critically think about what Sartre is doing, um, it's crucial to obviously focus on the arguments themselves, but it's also crucial to try and understand, in a sense, the strategic place of those arguments. Um, so this is him in, in itinerary of a thought. The idea, he says, which I have never ceased to develop, is that in the end one is always responsible for what is made of one. And it's around that kind of idea, it's around this articulation of autonomy that, that we're going to find a kind of interesting development. Um, so let's continue for a bit. Even if one can do nothing else beside assume this responsibility. For I believe a man, that a man can always make something out of what is made of him. I think this is a really lovely phrase. I believe that a man can always make something out of what is made of him. This is the limit I would today accord to freedom. The small movement which makes of a totally conditioned social being someone who does not render back completely what his conditioning has given him, which makes of Gene a poet when he had been rigorously conditioned to be a thief. And he goes on in that passage to describe the, the book he wrote on, on Gene. Um, as, as the place in which he best describes freedom. And it's for this reason, obviously, this relationship to autonomy or freedom, um, which it, it, it's for this reason that we need to begin to try and sort of understand the, the dynamic, the itinerary of Sartre's thought and locate transcendence of the ego and the relationship, particularly to spontaneity of consciousness, um, the relationship to that text. Let's just continue a little bit. This is again Sartre describing his 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 trajectory, his, his philosophical development. You know, being a nothingness traced an interior experience without any coordination with the exterior experience of a petty bourgeois intellectual, which had become historically catastrophic at a certain moment. For I wrote being a nothingness after the defeat of France, after all. But catastrophes have no lessons unless they are the culmination of a praxis. Then one can say my action has failed. But the disaster which overwhelmed the country had taught us nothing. Thus, in being a nothingness, what you could call subjectivity is not what it would be for me now, the small margin in an operation whereby an interiorization re-exteriorizes itself in an act. But subjectivity and objectivity seem to me entirely useless notions today. Anyway, I might still use the term objectivity, I suppose, but only to emphasize that everything is objective. The individual interiorizes his social determinations. He interiorizes the relations of production, the family of his childhood, the historical past, the contemporary institutions. 
and he then re-exterior to exteriorizes these in acts and options which necessarily refer us back to them none of this existed in being and nothingness and so what are the, what's what's important about this is that by 1969 any sense in which we might be able to ascribe to Sartre a concept of like absolute freedom um, <coughs> a completely individualistic notion of freedom any kind of sense in which that's capable of being ascribed to him which it often is um, there is often a kind of rejection of Sartre because he's got uh, you know what people think of as an extreme or overly radical notion of freedom or he's got an extreme and overly radical notion of subjectivity any of this it's obviously something that he, he himself doesn't perceive to be what he was doing with his work. And so it suggests to us that at, at the very least, and this is not to say we should completely believe him, but at the very least we should be cautious when we approach that work um, in terms of understanding it. Uh, and in particular when we approach that work in terms of understanding the concepts of freedom and the subject. And so we will hopefully be able to return and get back to that point a little bit towards the end of the lecture. Um, for now though let's move on to the specific text that we're looking at which is transcendence of the ego and what I want to try and really focus on today is something that I, I brought up and I think in the first lecture which is um, the relationship to unity and the source of unification um, in particular within experience um, so the a basic problem might be something like, uh, let's say, Sartre's concept here of a pre-reflective consciousness that's spontaneous. This is the concept that's being developed inside the transcendence of the ego. Sartre's concept of a, a spontaneous pre-reflective mode of consciousness um, that, in a sense, is always overflowing itself and that presents us sometimes with what he's described as a monstrous freedom and seems to be something that, in a sort of, in a way, you know, well, <laughs> in many ways, threatens us. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things here is obviously this relationship to this sort of spontaneous pre-reflective consciousness uh, has to be understood as a plurality. Um, there's a plurality of these moments. There's, there's many moments of this spontaneous pre-reflective consciousness. And one of the uh, kind of key questions then is in what sense and how uh, do these moments form uh, anything that we might think of as a unified subject, or a subject that has a kind of ongoing persistence. Um, and at the crux of existentialism, often, uh, often understood under the slogan, existence precedes essence, at the crux of this is a kind of refusal of the uh, unification of a variety a plurality of experiences a refusal of the unification of those of that plurality of experiences under some pre-existing um, object that they are all attached to somehow like you know um, elements that are you know, at the end of strings attached to a you know a fundamental pole and that's dug into the ground and all these sort of let's say they're kites at the end of strings there's maybe a hundred of these but they're all somehow attached to the pole in the ground um, and so the pole in the ground there forms a kind of holding point, a kind of crux point at which everything can be unified through, everything can be brought together through. Um, and so the moments, this plurality of moments of pre-reflective consciousness, um, how do we bring them together? How do we kind of see them to be uh, part of the same subject? Now the moments aren't atoms, and that's kind of, first of all, we, we mustn't think of them as radically sort of um, atemporal uh, points in space or time. We have to, it's realistic that, that we can think of them perhaps as extended, we can think of them as extended in duration, as having a kind of vagueness perhaps at the beginning and end. Um, so we're not trying to think of the moments necessarily as points, but but even then, these kind of moments, even if we think of them as extended and as having some sort of, ex, you know, duration um, with a kind of vague point at which they begin and a slightly vague point at which they end, uh, again the question is, is why do they, how and how do they come to be mine? How do they all come to be mine? How do they become unified as that, um, as those experiences of a particular subject? Why? Um, when you wake up in the morning and, you, you know, you've come through the process of being unconscious, uh, why does your consciousness have no difficulty, as it were, connecting back 
the previous night with the existing morning. Um, and all the way through Sartre, we find lots of these little novelistic moments, a lot of these little descriptions of the way in which consciousness, both pre-reflective and reflective consciousness, we find lots of these descriptions of the way in which consciousness works, a lot of these sort of semi-phenomenological descriptions. And they're all, in a sense, these novelistic moments um, throughout Sartre's work. And we kind of um, have, a, have a kind of false impression of unity presented to us by novels in many cases. And a better way of thinking about this problem of unity is to imagine the novel as a manuscript um, that's not sort of put together. It's just a pile of papers. And somehow you're wandering along and, you know, your pages of your book that are in this manuscript, you're wandering along and, and you drop it. Someone knocks you over. The paper, your pages go everywhere. And so it's all spilt and scattered. Um, and in putting those pages back together, and it, if you're not the author, in putting those pages back together um, and then trying to sort of find the unity, that novelistic unity, that narrative unity of that, you're going to have to use all these kind of clues as to what comes first, what comes after, how these are organised, and you're going to be left with this kind of puzzle of unification. What's the connection, for example, between those moments of, of making love or the moment of pulling a spanner while you're working on a machine or an engine or the moment of staring out of the bus window um, or scrubbing the dirt from your fingernails after a day of work? What are the connections between all these moments? Um, and these are the kind of moments of pre-reflective consciousness in some ways, that sort of moment of staring out of the bus or the, or the time you're, you're scrubbing your fingernails after work. You know, how do these become brought together? How do these become unified how do these become connected how do we get as it were some sort of unity of the self both over time something like a process and in time something like a state well we have to remember that the key thesis of transcendence of the ego um, which he expresses on page 98 is that transcendental consciousness is an impersonal spontaneity The body question is interesting. There's some interesting pieces in in the text on, on the body. Um, I'll have to kind of get back to that question. Uh, but let's just, I want to continue just for a moment on this key thesis. Transcendental consciousness is an impersonal spontaneity. So one of the things that's crucial about that is there's no person uh, pre-existing the pre-reflective spontaneous productions of consciousness. Um, these productions are impersonal. They're prior to a person. Um, uh, and the person is going to come afterwards. And so the person is going to essentially be one of the things we, we use as a name for this kind of relationship of unity. And Sartre breaks down this, this unity, particularly in section two of the text, uh, which is called Constitution of the Ego, part two of the text. He breaks down this unity into a series of different areas. Um, the area of the unity of states, uh, the area of the unity of actions, and that of qualities. Um, so the unity of states is, is roughly speaking, that sort of uh, space in which we might have reference to the me, um, and the unity of actions where we might have something like reference to the I. And so these, this, this, this sort of separation into states, actions, and qualities is kind of key, and this is, this is what he's working through all the way through the second section of Transcendence of the Ego. But right at the beginning of that section, there's an important distinction that he makes that we need to... Um, focused on and and kind of get clear. So right at the beginning of his discussion of the unity of states of actions, states and actions and qualities, he, he talks about two modes of unification. Um, two modes of unification of the flux of the unconscious. And this is what's on screen at the moment. There exists, he says, an imminent unity of these consciousnesses. And this is described as the flux of consciousness constituting itself as the unity of itself. A really deeply, like, obviously, philosophical language. It's one of those kind of strange sentences that people often read when they're not sort of, um, you know, they've not got 25 years uh, of, of, like, being used to philosophy. It's one of those sentences that you read and you think, constituting itself as the unity of itself. This seems a little odd, seems, you know, like a typical philosophical mode. But this is the first sort of mode of unity, um, imminent unity, something like self-constitution. And then the second mode 
of unity is transcendent unity. It's the unity of transcendent unities and is itself transcendent. So again, we have this like strange, you know, doubling up of concepts, this sort of way in which concepts, when referred back to themselves, have this very, very strange way of, of almost opening up a kind of, you know, um, infinity of problems. And and obviously when he's saying it, it, the ego as a, the ego is a unity of states and of actions, and as such, it's the unity of transcendent unities. We've again got this doubling up, the unity of unities. And so let's try and sort of, sort of see if we can get clear this distinction between imminent unity and transcendent unity, because it's um, an important way in which we need to understand what occurs after that moment of reflection. So what occurs and what is different between pre-reflective consciousness and reflected, the reflective consciousness. So in the imminent unity, we, <coughs> we've got this flux of consciousness constituting itself as the unity of itself. He's drawing here on Husserl's work. Um, he explicitly footnotes this. Um, and he's drawing on Husserl's work um, on, on what's called inner time consciousness. Um, <coughs> sorry. And what Husserl did there is he developed a notion that essentially... Uh, presented something like that we might encounter under the idea of stream of consciousness but what he does is present this relationship as having a kind of um as kind of uh not it's again not an atom uh, not a, a point it's not a, an atomic moment that's sort of outside of time it kind of extends forward uh, in what he calls protension and it retains from behind in what he calls retention um elements elements of a whole and so when we encounter time when we encounter these things we don't encounter it as um, discrete separate moments we encounter it as process we encounter it as what Bergson would call something like duration we encounter it as uh, something that we can't break down adequately we can't actually analyze into completely finite discrete atoms we can't take a notion of time and break it down into the atomic clock moments or, or seconds on a, on a clock hand um, because the relationship to time doesn't actually operate like that relationship to time has this kind of uh, this kind of um, projection and shadow it has this 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 you know a distinct elongation rather than being a discrete moment and so in the flux of consciousness that constitutes itself as the unity of itself <laughs> I know that's a strange phrase, but this being the imminent unity, um, what we have is a kind of coming together of, of, of moments into a singular whole, into a singular kind of um, narrative episode, let's say. And it, it's, it's self-constituting. It produces um, something like a melody or a rhythm. Um, uh, out of the flux of notes and beats and it's important to think about music perhaps as a good analogy in this situation so obviously you know when we think of music we can think of it being written on the page we can think of each of those notes and and you can do the same when it comes to something like drumming but you can think of each of those notes on the page and if you begin to think of those as the music itself then you have a kind of deep problem because in fact the music doesn't arise just by um, just by a kind of putting together uh, one after another of the notes. Um, it precisely arises as a kind of synthesis of a whole series of, of these notes, a whole series of these kind of discrete moments that in fact only get their value in relationship to the way in which they're organized, only get their value in relationship to this wider kind of formation. And so the melody or the rhythm doesn't exist inside the specific note. Um, it doesn't even exist inside like a series of notes that you could put together, um, you know, one after the other. Um, it, you know, let's say you played one note this year and the next note next year. You know, the actual melody itself, in order for it to be able to arise, or the rhythm, in order for it to be able to arise, comes about through a kind of what's what we can call a, a synthesis, um, a synthetic unity. Um, so whilst we can articulate or we can imagine the discrete element. Um, in fact, it's important to remember that that's a kind of artificial abstraction. Um, and this is kind of crucial when it comes to this pre-reflective consciousness. Is whilst we can think of consciousness as existing 
as it were, in discrete moments. In fact, it exists in this kind of durational relationship. Um, and so they are much more like short narrative moments in a novel um, than they are the individual words on the page. Now the transcendent unity, and, this, <laughs> and the transcendent unity um, as a, yeah, a unity of transcendent unities, this is going to be a little bit more curious um, and this is going to lead us to an interesting concept that we need to begin to think about and which we haven't really touched upon yet. So we get transcendent unities of states and actions. This is one of the things um, that occurs as his description in, in part two of the book. And I'm going to take a break in a couple of minutes so that we can have a little bit of a break here. But we get in the second part of the book this description of uh, the constitution of the ego by descriptions, first of all, of, of, you know, trans state of states as transcendent unities of consciousness and action as transcendent unities of consciousness. And we get this kind of focus on these states, these actions, these qualities. And then we get this move to the actual ego itself. And so it's it's like, why why have we got states, actions, qualities and ego why are these four different particular moments and the ego is that which is the transcendent unity of transcendent unity so it's the kind of last moment here um, and so so why begin with these initial points why begin with states and actions um, and one of the things we want to sort of approach here is that what we've been talking about so far is is the pre-reflective consciousness and then reflective consciousness um, so we've had two elements in our hands, two moments, and a kind of dividing point of which you kind of, you know, at which reflection takes place. But in fact, there are three parts to consciousness that we need to think of, and three parts that that Sartre is putting forward inside Transcendence of the Ego. Um, and it's this third part that I want to sort of begin to focus on and begin to get us to kind of get to grips with, because it's this third part as well that's going to um, illuminate how it might be possible to find Sartre moving from this. Um, key sort of philosophical focus on consciousness into uh, a relationship to Marxism, to society, to politics and all these kind of things. It's this third moment that's going to be kind of the way in which we can begin to perceive um, his strategy for autonomy um, uh, really engaging and really engaging with an interesting philosophical problem and one that, one that all of us kind of have to engage with. Um, so let's just take a break at that point and we'll come back to this third moment um, in let's say five minutes it's it's 7 30 at the moment so let's come back at 7 35 and we'll look at that um, so go in the moment go and have a stretch go and get some water go and have a pee do what you need to do um, but just uh, you know um, let your mind switch off for a moment 
Okay, let's um, let's return a little bit. Wrong glasses. <laughs> God, I never quite know which ones I'm putting on sometimes. Um, I'm gonna have to get those special glasses that have like two bits. All right. So this third moment, these two forms of unity, these third moment. Let's see whether we can sort of. Uh, work out what's going on. So three parts to consciousness, not just two. There's not just the pre-reflective and the reflective. There are three parts to consciousness. Um, one of them is imminently organized. The first part, the pre-reflective, the flux of consciousness constituting itself as the unity of itself. This is imminently organized. And the other two parts um, are transcendent to this imminent flux. And so in the flux of consciousness, which we talked about last week in the example of, of repugnance and hatred, in the flux of consciousness, that flux is where we encounter the repugnance. It's also important to remember that it's still intentional. Um, in other words, that it's still consciousness of, it's not like self, it's not self-absorbed. It's always, a, it's always intentional, it's always directed out of itself. Um, and in that situation, we can uh, we can encounter Sartre thinks uh, sort of the use of an eye. Um, if if we're in the middle of doing something and someone asks what we're doing, um, he says we might, we might describe or respond by going, "I'm doing this." You know, I'm, I'm you know, what are you doing at the moment, Matt? I, I'm talking about Sartre on Twitch. Um, but of course, it's just as easy for that that eye, which is a kind of indexical there. Um, it, it doesn't have any content. It's just as easy, and we can see, for that to, to drop out of the sentence and for us to still understand what's going on. So someone says, what are you doing, Matt? And I simply say, uh, talking about Sartre on Twitch. Um, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no difference in that relationship there. So, so there, there is a sense in which in, in the flux of consciousness, there can be an I moment um, in language. But that's not the eye moment that Sartre is really interested in, and it's not um, anything other than what he calls an empty eye. But in that flux of consciousness, we have this kind of um, what we might call sensations. They're experiences. Um, often inside the text, he uses this German word, erlebnis, um, which is uh, it's used by philosophers in this way because it's intended to try to indicate that there's something a little bit untranslatable about it. It's also used um, in a semi-pretentious way by some people um, just to kind of point to the fact that they know a bit of the German. Um, but this this word just essentially in this sense sort of means experience or we might sometimes think of as a sensation. So in that flux of consciousness, that's where we kind of locate the f what we might call the feeling of repugnance. Um, so when Peter comes in, this person um, who I have a particular kind of relationship to, um, I encounter this, or I, you know, feel this this sense of of repugnance. And then, so that's the first, and there's a kind of that's the first level. That's the pre-reflective consciousness, and it has this kind of imminent unity. So the repugnance doesn't just come and go; <laughs> you know, it kind of is there while the person is there, and it kind of persists, and it maybe lingers a little bit when they leave. Um, and it may be, it may even be sort of there, you know, before they arrive, if I know that they're coming, and all these kind of things. So that's first stage. It's, it's, it's. There's nothing outside of it that's bringing it together. There's no pre-existing person um, who has the repugnance. There's no pre-existing consciousness um, that sort of changes state. Consciousness is consciousness of. Um, and in that situation, it expresses itself, or it's, it's felt as repugnance, you know, repugnance of Peter. First stage. Second stage, reflection occurs. Th things like questions like, you know, what am I doing? How am I feeling? And in that moment, we get this first transcendent unity. So the distinct between the imminent unity and the transcendent unity. Imminent unity is, is kind of self-unifying. Transcendent unity needs this other thing outside of it to bring the elements together. Let's just move that off. And in those elements, that's where we're beginning to find these unities of states and unities of actions. And so the unities of states, how am I feeling? Um, the response to that kind of uh, presents an eye that has the state um, and in doing so this eye is kind of transcendent to the states themselves in other words outside of the states themselves it's kind of it's kind of a kind of 
a receptacle or a holder of these states. And same with what you know, how, you know, how am I feeling? Or same with what am I doing? With what am I doing? It's the I that has the action. I've been doing this with the feeling. It's the me that feels a particular kind of way. But in both situations, that I and that me are transcendent objects, as it were, to the consciousness itself. They're, they're kind of taking uh, this this uh, well, some kind of they, they form like a substance that has qualities, um, but it's not. Uh, that's not that, that that transcendent unity is not the primary mode of consciousness and in a sense what happens is because of these transcendent unities we mistake uh, these productions of consciousness for consciousness itself we was, we mistake the reflective level for the pre-reflective level and we kind of get entangled in all sorts of um uh, delusions or illusions or sort of distortions because of this process. So we have these first two levels. So we have these first two moments: the pre-reflective, the flux of consciousness, imminent unity; uh, the reflective level, um, where we have transcendent unities of states. Um, how am I feeling? And actions. What have I been doing? But then there's this third moment, and this is third moment that's kind of the actual moment of the ego, where the I fully content-filled. Um, comes into process comes into um, in, in you know into view as it were but it comes into view always out of the corner of our eye it's never you know it's never immediately the first moment the first moment when I ask a question what am I doing is that sort of moment of the eye that is doing the thing or how am I feeling it's the me that is feeling the things um, but the the subject of the ego that that subjectivity um, is something that is, you know, a, a another layer back. It's another layer on top of these things. It's again another unity of unities. And the word that we need to introduce at this point is horizon. The ego here is a horizon. Um, so whenever I'm asked something like, "What am I doing?" and I'm responding with a particular kind of, you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Sartre on Twitch at the moment. Um, and I become, you know, I'm ref and then I reflect on what I'm doing, which I probably won't be doing. <laughs> Try and keep in, you know, that not too reflective. Um, but whenever I do that, the, uh, out, it's always within the constitution of, of uh, it's always within the sort of framework um, of uh, being a subject. And that framework is kind of all around me. It's a totality that kind of brings together the moments of today when I answer that question, the moments of yesterday, my history, my future, and it's that kind of um, framework or horizon all the way around. Which is why the ego here is called uh, a unity of unities, a transcendent unity of unities. The first set of unities are the states, the actions, qualities, and that unity of those unities is the ego. And it only appears, as I say, as a horizon out of the corner of our eye. So we have these three moments. We have the flux, the flux of consciousness. We have the moments of reflection where we encounter the I that's doing stuff and the me that is sort of in a state of some kind. And then we have this third moment of the horizon at which we encounter the ego itself, the subject, if you like. Now, for anyone who was remembering or thinking about the anti Oedipus class that I ran, uh, Schizoanalysis for Beginners, um, I think there's an interesting analogy that I'm, I'm kind of curious to explore a bit further, um, although not in this class, uh, I'm afraid, but I am curious to explore a bit further. There's an interesting analogy between these three moments and the three syntheses of production, recording and consummation that we encounter in anti Oedipus. Um, and that the reason I'm sort of touching upon that is I think there's, there's some very interesting analogies between reading particularly things like Transcendence of the Ego and the later works of people like Deleuze and Guattari in anti Oedipus. Um, not just in terms of some of the structures, but also in terms of things like the targets, the strategic targets. Again, the strategic target in anti Oedipus is uh, Freudian psychoanalysis. And again, the argument there is that it's kind of got things backwards. Um, a post hoc ergo proctor hoc um, fallacy, but that's to, for that's for people that might have been in in the Antipas class, the schizoanalysis for beginners class. Um, and I say there's a kind of curious and interesting analogy there. 
But we've got these three moments. We've got the flux, we've got the reflections and the first set of unities, the I and the me, and then we've got the horizon where we encounter the ego, the unity of these transcendent unities. Um, and we have this connection again with this two ways in which those unities are taking place. And remember this, this, this imminent mode, the first, the flux, and then the transcendent mode, which are the different unities, the unity of the I, the unity of the me, the unity of states, the unity of actions. Um, and the unity of those unities in the ego. But that split between imminent and transcendent is also one mapped onto uh, a key division that seems to be crucial to Sartre at this point between where activity and passivity lie. And so it's in the imminent um, that we find the active, we find the flux to be active, and we find the transcendence, or both the unities of, of I that is doing and me that is a state, we find that particular section to be passive and both passive both at the first level of unity and at the second level of unity and so we encounter something if you if you like and this is where we can begin to sort of separate out or or, 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 or do the semantic thing that philosophy does you know we can kind of make some distinctions here so it's in for Sartre in the transcendence of the ego it's that first active flux that's going through processes of imminent unification that is really what he thinks of as consciousness um, that's really what he thinks of as consciousness. The second, the passive moments, the different unities, of states and of actions, and then the ego that's a unity of those, this is the psychic. This is what we might think of as the mind. And his problem with psychology and his problem with psychoanalysis is that essentially they, they don't actually deal with consciousness as he perceives it. Um, and they don't deal with anything other than the psychic or what we might encounter in the mind and they don't therefore deal with anything other than the passive productions um, that have made us what we are um, rather than the active flux that enables us to be free or that presents us with our freedom if you like and it, it brings us to the question which is what I want to kind of begin to, to touch upon a bit more now um, and which the last couple of weeks of this course hopefully we'll be able to sort of explore in a little bit more depth um, it brings us to the question of where is freedom in all of this Sartre has been talking and I've been talking to you about Sartre um, in terms of consciousness in terms of these reflective and pre-reflective moments in terms of this kind of quite technical language um, th these kind of curious distinctions around the concepts of reflection but where do we find freedom in this and and that's not just an abstract question obviously for most people um, the knowledge of Sartre um, and the knowledge of existentialism is likely to be almost hand in hand with a kind of claim to freedom radical freedom um, and so you know I, I want to be able to sort of connect those things up and also, in a sense, the spur to this course in this in this particular situation was the encounter with um, a kind of strange relationship to freedom that we had when asked to be locked down um, under COVID. Um, you know, in, fr freedom in that situation becomes a kind of curious self-disciplining um, or an acceptance of, of things that, that, you know, in a sense... Uh, that, that in, a, in a sense impinge upon our freedom um, and we encounter in particular the dialogue you know that's going on in discourse about the way in which people are behaving and, and as we come out of lockdown we encounter um, other people's actions um, as both limits and expressions of freedom in very curious ways so when we encounter them as being you know uh, as, as, as doing what they want um, we encounter their freedom as a kind of irresponsibility um, and so quite often it, it's difficult to work out uh, in particular for someone like Sartre and in particular in this text where where freedom is in all of this there's a lovely phrase it uses at one point where he talks about freedom how it be, about consciousness being a chained consciousness um, and in some sense what we want to think of freedom as is uh, the way in which chained consciousness is liberated but it's also important to, to to consider and this is something he says in the psychology of imagination page 67 of psychology of imagination in, in my edition if, if you're on river i can get you a copy of this but one of the things he says in that is he makes it he makes a, a an interesting point about what the opposite of freedom is um 
most of the time we encounter freedom as a kind of distinction between freedom on the one hand free will is the one of the ways in which we might you know, hear it and determinism on the other and in fact Sartre says that it's fatalism not determinism that's the opposite of freedom and here I think we can begin to um, begin to encounter some of the thought about why freedom often often is encountered as a kind of vertigo why freedom is often encountered um, as something that is, is a challenge or why we might have anguish in, in, in the face of it um, for Sartre freedom arises and is consciousness um, particularly the spontaneous pre-reflective consciousness and we particularly encounter it in a relationship to this but freedom is uh, the capacity not to have to put up with the inevitable not to um, be what I be what I have been um, not to be determined by my past um, in being a nothingness he says freedom is the human being putting his past out of play by secreting his own nothingness and by the time we get to being a nothingness freedom is is the obsessive kind of word of the text i actually looked it up today because i wanted to see you know just just how much from my own reading of this whether i was distorting this and and so i did a you know pdf search and in a in a book that has about 650 pages of sartre's text we encounter the word freedom 891 times so you know considerably more than once a page um so th this is the obsessive relationship uh that's that's orientated the text inside being a nothingness and here what i want to try and do is connect that to, to transcendence, transcendence of the ego in transcendence of the ego freedom is not a big concern um, but spontaneity and activity is and so we've moved from an encounter with the spontaneous active element to the next moment in being a nothingness where essentially Sartre is is now very very heavily focused on how does this spontaneity how does this activity express itself or, or, or get conceived in terms of our freedom and freedom is a kind of break point between what I have been and what I will be that's that's the crux for Sartre of what freedom is it's his break point this capacity to annihilate this capacity to negate what I have been in order to open up the freedom of what I can be and what I will be now I want to sort of read a little piece here um, to do with the relationship of anguish that he talks about in being in nothingness and freedom and the reason I want to do that is because I think it might enable us to, particularly in the seminar, um, to <laughs> begin to orientate uh, the difference and the distinction between consciousness and this, this sort of divisions and determinations and distinctions that he's drawing in consciousness and how it operates in terms of uh, a conception of freedom. So let me just bring that up for you. Better. let's make that a little bit bigger so he's talking here about the, the fact that anguish in relationship to freedom something that we you know we find in people like heidegger anguish in relationship to freedom actually is not uh, the continual state in which we encounter our freedom um, it's something that occurs a bit rarely this is on page uh, this is on page 37 of being in nothingness and so he describes here the process of writing a book um, and actually I'm in the middle of doing something similar so it kind of stuck to it, it struck it, you know, it struck me a little bit so I want to just use this anyway so in order for my freedom, this is Sartre, in order for my freedom to be anguished in connection with the book which I am writing this book must appear in its relation with me on the one hand I must discover my essence as what I have been I have been wanting to write this book I have conceived it, I have believed that it would be interesting to write it, and I have constituted myself in such a way that it is not possible to understand me without taking into account the fact that this book has been my essential possibility. On the other hand, I must discover the nothingness which separates my freedom from this essence. I have been wanting to write, but nothing, not even what I have been, can compel me to write it finally i must discover the nothingness which separates me from what i shall be 
I discover that the permanent possibility of abandoning the, abandoning the book is the very condition of the possibility of writing it, and the very meaning of my freedom. It is necessary that in the very constitution of the book as my possibility, I apprehend my freedom as being the possible destroyer in the present and in the future of what I am. So it's, it's, this, it's this fine line. It's this fine line between what I've been wanting to do, the way in which that's produced who I am and what I am, and, and the fact that at any moment, I can, I can not, nothing, nothing is going to force me from what I have been into what I will be. Nothing can force that. That's what he means by saying that freedom is, is the opposite, not of determinism, but it's the opposite of fatalism. When I believe that I've got no options, when I believe that I can't but do something, that's the kind of escaping from freedom. And that's the kind of rejection of freedom. Freedom for Sartre is this, as I say, this line between the I have been and the I will be, and a kind of breaking of any connection between those two moments. And it's a breaking of connection, to bring it back to the work we're doing on transcendence of the ego, it's a breaking of connection, as he says here, that takes place on the plane of reflection. And so this is kind of the curious thing, and it's a kind of ambiguity or a strangeness here um, that we need to, to work with. Freedom then isn't identifiable with the pre-reflective, active, spontaneous consciousness. That's not the freedom. That's, it, it's like, it's, it's, uh, this, is, this is a kind of difficult one because it's not really the source of freedom. It's the, it's, it's the way in which the fact that I am free expresses itself. Um, but that, that fact that I am free is a kind of transcendental fact, which is what he means when he says, um, when he, that, this phrase, the condition of possibility, that's always a key to hearing something as being transcendental. So when he says here that, that I discover that the permanent possibility of abandoning the book is the very condition of the possibility of writing it and the very meaning of my freedom, here what we find is that freedom is this kind of transcendental constitution of the subject. Now, this is crucial because this is kind of the difference that he's placing against Husserl. For, for Husserl and for phenomenology and for Kant prior to that, um, the condition of possibility of experience was this I, the subject, remember. Um, for, for Kant, it's the I that can accompany any possible experience, and for, and for Husserl, it's the transcendental ego. So this thing that has to have it were as it were be there in order to unify all the varieties of experience for 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 sartre um the tra the condition of possibility is freedom itself and so in a sense the human or the the the, the, the you know the, the, uh, you know that which we are is free and cannot help but be free um hence why we might say we're condemned to be free um, but that distinction uh, between the different ways in which we might orientate the transcendental, the condition of possibility, and that distinction between the spontaneous consciousness and freedom, these are kind of crucial things to be able to articulate um, and to be able to sort of separate out a little bit in our analysis, all the while understanding that, that, that what's motivating Sartre is, as I said at the beginning, um, this strategic orientation towards autonomy and to strategic orientation towards um, accounting for autonomy in terms of what was the phrase again let's let's see if I can remember yeah how to give man both his autonomy and his reality among real objects avoiding idealism without laps lapsing into mechanistic materialism avoiding the idealism of he thinks uh, a transcendental condition such as the I or Kant or the transcendental eagle of, of Husserl or, or without falling into mechanistic materialism of determinism um, that I think is is going to hopefully be a space uh, that space of freedom that we can begin to explore and look at in the next couple of weeks. And obviously, in doing so, we'll be able to make stronger connections again with Kierkegaard and begin to see how this this curious relationship to freedom kind of um, articulates all of the existentialists together in many ways. It kind of brings them together. It's kind of what makes them into the school or the the thread or the, or the line of thinking that we can call existentialism. Okay, so that's the end for the day. Thank you very much for your time and
um, for all of the uh, attention and we'll take a sort of I'm gonna sort of stop the stream in a moment um, I'll start the zoom room but we'll have about five minutes again uh, break so go and get a cup of tea and we won't start the zoom seminar until about five past eight just for information for next week we're going to be looking at chapter three of the emotions next week a text by Sartre again um, if you're on River, if you're in the Free University of Brighton, that is now up on River and you can find a copy there. And we'll be reading um, from Chapter 3 of The Emotions. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I will see you later. Um, and I do stream games and stuff and you're welcome if, I, if I'm doing anything else during the week you're welcome to drop by and say hi or ask questions and you're welcome to obviously message me on Discord or anywhere else if you need to or remember if you remember the Free University Brighton um, but that's enough for today see you later <laughs>